Chapter 28, Mr. Kermit. The minutes blur into hours, which blur into days, which blur into weeks. The first thing the condemned man loses is his sense of time. All I know is that it's flying by too fast. For so long, I couldn't wait to be finished with my teaching career. Now, barreling full speed and out of control toward the finish line, all I want to do is make it last. It's tough to tell the kids that I won't be back after Christmas, but they take it better than I expected. Maybe they already know. The rumor mill in a middle school can be like that. They're the ones who changed everything for me. The unteachables. Ha! That's what happens when you put a closed mind bully like Thaddeus in charge. A school district where wonderful students are tossed aside like trash. Parker, the kid has a reading problem. Nothing more. The fact that no teacher ever bothered to find out find that out says more against the Greenwich schools than any cheating scandal. Barnstorm. Look at what they let him get away with because he happened to be a sports star. He never learned how to work before he never had to. Because he never had to. Elaine. I'm as guilty as anybody for taking so long to figure out that Elaine is smart. And she is. She's also good at hiding it. Her reputation doesn't help. But teachers are supposed to see around things like that. Mateo. The school jumped to conclusions about the kid's quirky personality. They wrote him off. He deserves better. Rahim was allowed to sleep and doodle through 6th and 7th grade before he was dumped into SCS 8. Today, he's an absolute star over at the community college. But what's more important is how well he's doing in 8th grade. Aldo might be the only one who belongs in SCS 8, but he's come a long, long way. He passed that science test, and the fact that he did isn't half as amazing as the fact that he even bothered to try. Finally, Kiana. She never had any business being in the class. She just drifted in and stayed. And not a single faculty member, myself included, bothered to look into who she was and what she was doing there. True, it worked out in the end. Kiana is a huge part of what, of what went right in room 117. But she could just as easily have fallen through the cracks, and all her potential would have been wasted. What's going to happen to the kids on December 22nd when I have to leave? Kiana will be fine. She'll be back in California, and anyway, a bright girl like that will find a way to succeed wherever she ends up. What about the others? Will the class get a real teacher? Or will the replacement be a babysitter? Or worse, a warden? It's too easy to see the progress of the past weeks being rolled back. Christina will try to, to do right by the students. But in the end, Dr. Thaddeus calls the shots. He might even kibosh the trips to Terranova Motors, which means so much to the kids. It hurts to admit it but the transformation of SCS-8 never could have happened without Jake. Part of it's the field trips, the time away from school. For kids like Aldo and Parker, the things they learned about cars are among the first things they ever learned, period. Or at least, learned without hating it. It might have started out as Jake trying to make up for his misdeeds of 27 years ago, but he's taken a real interest in those kids, and they know it. When someone cares about you, it's natural to respond. Strange that the man who used to be 12-year-old Jake should star in my teaching rebirth. And his co-star? Even stranger, Emma Fountain. Daughter of my fiancé who married someone else. Emma may be a fish out of water in middle school, with her bucket filling and her good bunnies, but her energy and enthusiasm were boundless and pure. She awakened a love of teaching in me that was buried before she was even born. Lately, I've been covering Emma's classes while she takes the SCS 8 group over to the dealership. I can't bring myself to go there anymore. I've made a kind of peace with Jake, even started to like him a little. But it doesn't change the fact that he's the reason Dr. Thaddeus developed the, his grudge way back when. Better to stay here in room 115 running circle time and playing nursemaid to Vladimir. Emma's students are okay. Mostly, there are just too many of them. Four to three minutes go by, a bell rings, and a new crew is sitting there, 
looking exactly like the old crew. I can't tell them apart, not like the unteachables, who are so distinctive and full of personality. Nobody is likely to mistake Aldo or Elaine for any other middle schooler. As the weeks fly past and December 22nd looms closer, I savor my time with the kids the way a gourmet lingers over a fine souffle. The class is spending so many afternoons at Terra Nova Motors these days that they're almost lost to me already. They leave on the minibus at 11 and barely make it back before the 3.30 bell. I read and reread Kiana's essays, lingering over her well-reasoned arguments. I relish the discussions with Elaine and Aldo as they work their way through where the red fern grows. I listen for the faint sound of Parker whistling through his teeth, a surefire sign that he's reading without having to struggle over every word. I cherish these things because I know I won't have them much longer. At this point, every puffy tail I award may well be my last. At home, the walls of my apartment are closing in on me. It never bothered me before, but it's driving me crazy now. This is the future, kicking around these two and a half rooms, one bath. I was planning to cash it in at the end of the year anyway, but with early retirement, I would have been able to redecorate, maybe even move to a nicer place in a better part of town. For sure, I would have traveled. I might not have the money for that now. And anyway, I'm so down that I can't think of a single spot on this green earth that I'm interested in visiting. Of course, I could look for a new job. There are other schools in America. But Thaddeus has pretty much taken care of that. How do you explain to a prospective employer that you were fired for cause? Any Google search of the name Zachary Kermit will eventually spit out the words cheating scandal, and that'll be a deal breaker. Besides, at 55, I'm not exactly a spring chicken. Starting over from scratch isn't a very attractive option. Saturday morning, I shuffle into the kitchen to investigate the prospects for breakfast. A cheese stick and a semi-stale dinner roll. I've stopped food shopping again. I was doing okay for a while, but the bad news jolted me into old ways. Oh well. With coffee, it should at least go down and stay there. Breakfast is interrupted by a series of clicks. It's the doorbell, or what would be the doorbell if the doorbell worked. Must be a mistake. Nobody ever comes to visit, and I haven't ordered anything. I pad barefoot to the door and peer through the peephole into the smiling face of Emma Fountain. What does she want at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning? She says, Don't pretend you're not home, Mr. Kermit. I can hear you walking around in there. I open the door. What brings you here so early? I've come to give you a ride to the science fair, she replies, as if it's the most obvious thing in the world. I'm not going to the science fair, I tell her. I'm not feeling very warm and fuzzy toward the school these days. But you can't miss it, she pleads. What about the kids? What kids? My kids? They won't be there. Nobody entered. She looks evasive. That might not exactly be true. The coffee is getting cold. Of course it's true. I'm their teacher. Don't you think I would have noticed if one of them was working on a science project? They did it as a group. I repeat, not possible. She drops the bombshell. They've been working on it at the dealership. It strikes a chord. The frequent extended trips to Terra Nova Motors. Emma accompanying the kids so I won't see what's going on. They've been doing this behind my back. It all fits. Except for one gigantic question. But why? They did it for you, she announces. For me? Why in a million years would they think I'd want them to? Then I remember. That random district policy... Ten points added to the science scores of all winners. That would be enough to... They're trying to save my job? She beams. Isn't it wonderful? No, I explode. It means the kids blame themselves for what happened. How would they even know about the connection to their test results? She studies the threadbare carpet. You had no right to tell them that, I rave. It's a gross violation of my privacy. Worse, it made them f feel pressure to enter a science fair. They have no chance of winning. Don't be mad at them. I'm not mad at them, I exclaim. I'm mad at you. They could never do this on their own. You set this up. You and that Terra Nova dimwit. 
Jake loves you. Yeah, well, I tremble to see what would happen if he hated me. She put on an expression I remember from Fiona, the I'm not taking no for an answer face. Okay, Emma concedes. So maybe we weren't totally up front with you, but your kids are at school ready to present their project, and if you're not there to support them, you're never going to forgive yourself. She doesn't fight fair. Pour yourself a cup of coffee, I say. I'll get dressed. Surrender. Total and unconditional. I might as well get used to it. Jake is waiting outside in the Porsche. Hi, Mr. Kermit. Long time no see. I scowl at him. He's a partner in this deception and deserves no better. Plus, with an entire car dealership at his disposal, he chooses to bring this motorized roller skate. For the students, I remind myself, squeezing into the tiny back seat. All the way to school, Jake keeps up a steady stream of conversation, ignoring frantic signaling from Emma to keep his big mouth shut. How about those kids doing this project on their own, he enthuses. They're really something. I'm too angry to answer. It's also possible that I'm too contorted in the back seat to make any sound. I'm getting reacqu reacquainted with my knees which are pressed up against my chest. When the porch Porsche reaches Greenwich Middle School, it takes the two of them to drag me out of the car. A banner over the front entrance declares, Greenwich Pu Public School Science Fair District Championships. The parking lot is packed. The school halls bustle with students and parents. I forgot how popular the science fair is. I knew once, back when I cared about such things. Walking stiffly, zombie style, after the tight car ride, I lumber inside, following Emma and Jake into the gym, which is the epicenter. The large space is filled with long tables, and colorful displays stretch as far as the eye can see. Students stand like sentries in front of their projects, excited and nervous, ready to face the judges. It's been a rotten day so far. But as soon as I spot the kids of SCS8, I feel the corners of my mouth turning upward. Even though I'm against this science fair idea 100%, I couldn't be more proud. My unteachables did this for me. Okay, I won't be their teacher for long, but I'm their teacher today, and I intend to act like it. Seeing me, their faces light up, and I smile wider. I must be losing my mind. A real teacher would be chewing them out, not beaming at them. I beam anyway, because they look so thrilled with themselves. Kiana, Aldo, Barnstorm, Mateo, Raheem, and Elaine. I approach the group. Where's Parker? With his grandmother, Kiana supplies. You'll see him soon. Ah, the famous Grahams. Some things never change. Well, let's have a look at this top secret project. I turn my attention to the display board behind them. The title is The Internal Combustion Engine. Obviously, the idea came working came from working at Terra Nova Motors. There are several fantastic drawings and diagrams done by Raheem. They're so professional that I wonder if the judges will believe it's a real student work. Beyond that, my heart sinks a little. The project is pretty thin. There's an information booklet with a few pages that could have been copied from any automotive web page. That's it. No working motor in a study that's supposed to be all about them, not even a model of one. I picture some of the other displays on the labyrinth of tables throughout the double gym. There's a miniature wind turbine and batteries that store the electricity it generates, a full call pendulum, a replica of the internal gyroscope that provides telemetry guidance for a ballistic missile. Everywhere, microscopes peer down at, sing at single-celled organisms. Geiger counters click. Test tubes bubble, and static electricity jumps up Jacob's ladders. These projects come from the most talented science students in the entire district, not just Greenwich Middle School. The internal combustion engine is a nice effort, but it doesn't come close to anything else here. This is like entering a grape into competition against 200-pound watermelon at the state fair. Anger surges inside me. Maybe Jake doesn't know any better, but Emma surely understands that the internal combustion engine doesn't stand the chance of an ice cube in a molten lava against the other projects here. I take in the proud, hopeful faces of the unteachables. It goes without saying that they're about to finish 
dead last. They could very well be laughed out of the competition. The blow could destroy their confidence and undo most of the progress of the past weeks. The judges are at the very next table, practically chortling with glee as they watch a small robot shoot baskets at a nerf hoop built into the giant crate that is the display. Two men and a woman, the high school science teachers, along with a professor from the local college. They make notes on their clipboards, but there's no mistaking the enjoyment on their faces. Not for long, I think, as the threesome approaches the internal combustion engine. The kids are so amped that you could almost hear a power hum emanating from them. I feel a little sick. I resolve then and there to make a big stink if the judges are unkind about the project. Why not? There's no downside. What can they do? Complain to Thaddeus and get me fired? To my relief, the three are respectful and professional. They're obviously not very impressed, but they go through the motions of examining the display. They even come up with a few questions to ask. The college professor reads through the booklet and comes to the last page. I never made it that far. There are exactly two words written in large block capitals. Look outside. An arrow points toward the gym's corner exit, which opens out to the parking lot. The man frowns. What does this mean? A lane's deep baritone supplies the answer. Maybe it means you know, look outside. This way, adds Barnstorm, thump swinging on his crutches towards the door. The judges follow, herded like cattle by the rest of the class. What's going on? I whisper to Emma. She smiles at me, misty-eyed. That would spoil the surprise. Jake is grinning, which is almost worse than her kindergarten ways. I am so not in the mood. I step out of the gym and look around, mystified. Nothing's there. Nothing but parked cars. And then, an enormous roar cuts the air, an ear-splitting vroom so loud that you feel it under your fingernails. All attention is wrenched away from the vehicle's in a lot to the single car standing in the driveway, revving its enormous engine. It's an amazing sight. The paint job is bright red with flecks of silver that catch the sunlight and dazzle the eye. Emblazoned on the driver's door is the image of a leaping frog. Sparks fling from the animal's powerful back legs, spraying the full length of the chassis to the rear bumper. There's no hood, and the motor has been raised to full view, shiny and brand new. Twin tailpipes, gleaming chrome, slashed down both sides of the car. Multicolored LED lights flash from every wheel rim. Stunned and speechless, all I can do is stare. Emma is clamped onto my arm, cutting off the circulation. What does this hot rod have to do with a middle school science fair entry? The judges are pop-eyed. This is your project? The woman from the high school breathes. The kids nod, tickled pink with themselves. It's our working model, Kiana brags. Aldo leans into the gym and bellows, In your face, losers! They built the engine from parts of my shop, Jake explains, his voice hoarse with pride. My mechanics supervised, but the kids did all the work. They did everything, Emma confirms. One of them is even the driver. That's when I recognize Parker at the wheel, grinning so wide that his face is about to break. Why is there an elderly woman with him? The professor wants to know. That's Graham's, Kiana explains. It's a long story. They did a lot more than just put an engine in, Jake goes on. You're looking at new tires, rims, glass, wipers, interior, and the bodywork. Remember, this car is 27 years old. I snap to attention. 27 years old? I can't believe I didn't see it before. Sure. It's all rebuilt and fancy and souped up, but the original shape is still there, hidden beneath the tailpipes and the chrome and the blinding paint job. It's, it's, God bless America, it's the Coco Nerd.